everyone here and anyone watching uh, on YouTube later. I'm John Harmon, and this is the Data Science Learning Community's R Packages Book Club, Cohort 6. Uh, we just finished reading the second edition of R Packages, and today we're welcoming Jenny Bryan, one of the co-authors of the book. Uh, Jenny maintains some of my favorite packages, such as Use This, DevTools, and Reprex. And she's extremely knowledgeable about package development and is just a joy to speak to. So welcome, Jenny. Thanks for the nice introduction. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Excellent. We're very happy to have you here. Um, so I have some questions that uh, mostly people in this cohort have submitted before, and then people can feel free to ask questions in the chat, and I will uh, open up you know, when we run out of the pre-submitted ones, basically. Or if anything kind of coordinates, I'll try to fit those in. So, all right, let's start, uh, just get started. So Trevin Flickinger was the um, facilitator for this cohort. He, he organized the group um, and he says they found the whole game chapter really useful. Uh, what was your inspiration for that? Do you remember? <laughs> well, I do, like uh, my, my biggest ambition when Hadley invited me to help make the second edition happen is was addressing shortcomings that I identified in the book when I was using it, you know, much earlier, <laughs> sort of figuring out how to write packages myself. And I felt like it was a great reference when you knew kind of like exactly what piece of information you were looking at, like what is a description file or whatever. But it didn't um, provide a lot of guidance for like the daily workflows and like, like what, what do I do first? And what do I do next? And like, how often do you do that thing? Um, and so almost like the main thing I wanted to really add other like that we knew there were updates needed all over the place, <laughs> but was to bring this like workflow information in. Um, and so I think that probably was also like the first chapter that I actually <laughs> added was to show like, here's how all these functions and workflows work together to create a, like a minimum viable R package. <laughs> Um, and I think it was because I was just super, super confused about this <laughs> when I started. It was, I was also starting this back in the day when DevTools had, and like it still does technically have, but we just don't talk about it. <laughs> uh, this idea of dev mode. I don't know if any of you know what I'm talking about. It's good if you don't probably, <laughs> but there was kind of this notion of I'm in dev mode. Um, and that was a, a big part of my confusion over, but I think we eventually have, it has been decided that that wasn't a terribly useful concept. Um, but so it just really highlighted for me that like, I didn't know, I knew how to write an R function, but I didn't know <laughs> the, the process of putting it into a package and feeling like I had made like my first step towards making the package work. And so that's why the, the whole game came in. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for it. I love that uh, chapter, like Trevin said. Oh, good. So, <laughs> it's very useful. All right. Uh, next, getting kind of a little bit more into the weeds, I think, because uh, this is what I asked. <laughs> in uh, Back in chapter eight, that's the catch-all, like, other components chapter. Uh, um, other. <laughs> yeah. You, um, you talk about there's the tools folder, and there's, like, the official usage, and then you talk about kind of the off-label usage as like a place to store things that the package devs need while they're writing the package, um, like API details or like code for generating code. Do you recommend using it for that kind of usage or would you recommend something else or do you not really have <laughs> an opinion? I on think that? I, that was that section, like, and in particular that paragraph, this is the second unofficial use of the tool directory. <laughs> um, I actually went off and like had to do research about that. <laughs> like I ended up doing quite a lot of um, GitHub searches to find our packages that had a tools directory and then like what's in there. <laughs> and I remember sort of surveying my colleagues. So um, I guess I don't have a, a strong opinion on whether to do this off label use of it or to do that elsewhere. Um, do you have any examples from like your team or, or 
other posit teams that do anything like that that you can think of? I definitely found examples when I was doing this. Um, Gabor <laughs> has several okay. examples. I don't know if I can cough up which exact packages I'm they gonna, are. I'm but wondering if it's like our lib packages main. Yeah. Um, and I feel like shiny. I feel like shiny itself. Oh has this like they might use it to store a script you all can check me on this live yeah a, a script that they run every now and then when they vendor some dependencies into shiny yes updating web libraries yeah yeah and then i think gabor <laughs> has a few examples of doing that kind of task um read excel has a task like this as well <laughs> and you know if i had known that other people did this you know in hindsight maybe i would have put that i have a i have a directory called maintenance okay um that i'm basically using in this way where again i have a script that vendors <laughs> libxls in and then um, read Excel has a small collection of patches that we always apply and like, so I have to replay those on top of it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think it's great to, to keep <laughs> that kind of code somewhere is like super important because it's the same reason that having like the data dash raw directory is so useful is that the right. first time you make one of those things or you do this move, you know, vend it's usually vendoring somebody else's code or data into your package. You know, on that day, it feels like this is a one-time thing. <laughs> it's never, it's never a one-time thing. <laughs> like right. if, if your product lives on one year from now, you're going to want to update whatever it was you vendored in probably. And then you're not going to remember how you did it. Um, <laughs> So it is nice to have some place um, to store your little hacky scripts for doing that because they don't have to be like production quality, right? right. It's not going to go. It's not going to even be shipped to your user because it's if even if you use tools, but you're using it in this off-label way, you will make sure to our build ignore, right? That, right. So I, you know, maybe in that sense, it's confusing to use tools for it because <laughs> it's like not. That probably is true, and which is probably why it took me a while to write this incredibly short section, <laughs> because at first I assumed people were using tools the way tools is documented <laughs> to be. And then like I gradually like caught, caught on to the fact that, oh, sometimes people use it for other purposes, and then they are able to ignore it. Right. So. Awesome. Okay. Well, so that's one where there, I guess, kind of still isn't a consensus on, on how to use things. I don't things. think so. And it's, and it's, you know, it's pretty a niche phenomenon probably that you have. Um, cause, cause there's all these, there's a strong convention about data dash raw. So I think to the, right. to the extent that most of us need to do something like that periodically, it is usually about putting data in the package somewhere. So this tools trick, I think people use it when there's sort of even more, an even more complicated ingest task yeah. that has to happen every couple of years. Like it's long enough apart that you don't remember how you did it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I have done it with our raw because I was like, well, data raw, I'll make a um, similar. Mm. Oh thing yeah, if you're generating, generating code. code. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I had never seen. And, I, I also didn't know if there was a standard, so. All right, um, well, we can get out of the weeds um, a little little bit. <laughs> uh, Angel Feliz uh, asked about um, reverse dependency checks that, uh, you know, like the Tidyverse team uses. You mentioned there's a call out now about the um, cloud check function in the uh, rev dev check. Um, and in that call out, it teases that those checks are only available for posit, but uh, quote, we hope to offer this service for the broader R community in the future. Do you know if there's any update about that? I don't have an update on that, but um, 
one of you all should ping me to like <laughs> I will forward the ping ping okay. on if that is I'm sure it's still an ambition. I think it's well, there's a couple issues at least, which is um there's some cost, although it's not huge, but there's some cost. So you have to like think about that. Um probably the bigger question is that that whole infrastructure, the thing that goes off and runs the checks in parallel on AWS for us, is looked after by a different group of people. And that group of people looks after a whole lot of other things. And this is just kind of a small thing. And so I think if, if usage were to really increase and in particular increase beyond internal folks, then we'd have to think about like, all right, well, quite often, like slightly weird things happen. Right. And then right. you just slack yeah. those people, but like <laughs> if it's opened up to a larger community, you have to actually have a plan for having someone report weird stuff to you and all that. Right. But, so yeah, totally. I haven't heard anything new about that, but, and I can imagine that that is, um, that like everyone's thoughts about that are probably changing as for example, like our hub right. is now no, I think no longer primarily sort of taking your stuff to its own server. It's instead helping you, helping you do something <laughs> that GitHub actions is already capable of doing. So I could imagine applying that idea to reverse dependency checks. Like that's where you get the compute. Right is kind of an interesting idea. So it's possible also that the landscape for that has maybe changed in the past year. But it is like getting reverse dependency checks off of our own machines was so enabling. Yeah. Um, in terms of if you have some idea and you're like kind of worried that it's going to break <laughs> other people's stuff, you don't have to reason about it and speculate or you're not limited to that now, you can actually just sort of find out. And in the meantime, you can work on other things instead of having your computer, like the fans <laughs> right. like on 95. <laughs> and, <laughs> and like in the past, you couldn't, you couldn't easily switch away from the branch you were testing when the rev right. checks were running, right? Because they're being added <laughs> so you'd also have to find something else to go work on basically um so it's really nice to get them off your machine for sure i mean it kind of depends on the scale of the red right. checks right yeah i i you know never had anything where i think it really mattered but if you have any it takes you know some time because you never know it adds it, up very you know, quickly yeah well, and like uh, just people do weird things and, right. and other people can take on a lot of dependencies and a lots of dependencies yeah. on our Java using packages and then all <laughs> yeah. of those have to be installed. And yes. so it's really hard to scope the task. Like you don't really know how bad it's going to be until you start it. Yeah. And then you're yeah, stuck. especially you don't know what someone Waiting else might do it. in their tests. So, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it is nice to just send it off to a, a remote <laughs> sandbox yeah. and um, get a report later. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the book culminates in a chapter about submitting your package to CRAN. Uh, Stas Kalenikov asks if you have any best practices for package development in isolated environments when the packages are never intended to be submitted to CRAN. Is there anything that you cha would change for that? I know you don't really do that as much or if at all. Um, but yeah. if there is anything. Well, I think it liberates you in a lot of ways. Like you don't have to worry about imports versus suggests, for example, right? <laughs> Just everything right. is imports. And, <laughs> and, and so there's lots of, um, I'd say somewhat fiddly things like that, that you simply wouldn't have to worry about. But the basic idea of, playing within the rules, passing our command check, documenting your package in the way that everyone expects it to be documented, like has so many payoffs that even if I knew something wasn't 
going to Cran, I would make it the exception rather than the rule that I just play the, by the Cran rules. But an example of the kind of stuff that I certainly do in projects that aren't going to Cran is, you know, triple colon. Like <laughs> I will reach reach into other packages and use unexported <laughs> functions if that is handy to me. Like that kind of stuff. If it's not going to Cran, you can do it. And you know, you know what you're getting into. Like these <laughs> things could change. But um yeah, so I think it's probably a purely purely less less work, less stringent. You can just be like a little more relaxed. Fair enough. Um, so Trevin uh, was wondering uh, if you have, or what is a favorite package of yours outside of the tidyverse or outside of posit entirely? Um, he, cool. you know, I think he said, what is your favorite package? But I, I'm giving you a little bit of wiggle room of just a favorite package. <laughs> well, one that's just incredibly useful, <laughs> a couple <laughs> to me are, like JSON light and Gert yeah. and curl. So like Yarun Ohms from our open site maintains, in my opinion, a lot of things that are just <laughs> like super useful for enabling other stuff. Cause like, I don't do much data analysis anymore. Um, so I'm probably not a very exciting person to ask <laughs> about that. So I'm still answering it with a real sort of package maintainer developer yeah. hat on. But in terms of stuff I end up using and depending on a lot that's not in Tidyverse or Rlib or something, those are the, that little set of packages certainly comes to mind. So along those same lines, um, he was asking, like uh, use this and DevTools are super useful when you're writing packages. Are there any other uh, packages or tools that you use or that you can think of um, that are helpful when you are developing packages? Well, I think I saw that the good practice package that came off of CRAN, I don't know if it's back on. Yeah. But so there's good practice uh, and there's the one that checks for like complicated code like that looks at the cyclomatic complexity but in terms of checks that i think are pretty healthy and like you know maybe there's a you know they're not in use this or because i guess you know use this and dev tools try to stick really close to our command check but we all know there are other checks that are a very good <laughs> idea to run and so that again that little clump of packages i'm thinking of good practice and then is that is that the one that also analyzes your complexity? Or I think it's there's a it's, second package. It uses a package that does okay. that. I can't remember. Cy um, Cyclocomp or something like that yes, is the name of the exactly. package. Yeah. I mean, I so I find those kind of interesting to start to, yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the DevTools verse <laughs> stick, sticks really closely to our command check. Um, but so then that leaves like a lot of scope for things that we all kind of know are probably good ideas to like keep tabs on. Right. Um, and I think good practice and this cyclocomp package are kind of interesting ones to run over your code. Um, and it doesn't mean you'd act on all of it, but it's another one of these things you can do to get feedback, even if without getting recruiting some human to do it. Right. It's like automated, machine generated feedback some fraction of which is probably going to be pretty good like and useful to think about right um, yeah i i'm trying to um find uh, or trying to remember what else good practice runs because good practice is really just a bun you know it's a dev tools like thing where it's bundling a bunch of other packages yeah um i mean i th I, th I think it checks for um you know, do you always say true and false versus T and F? I mean, yes. of course, like lint, lint R is another incredibly helpful package um, yes. for that sort of thing. Um, you know, like super long lines, super complicated code. And then there's, yeah, there's just a few other 
kind of anti patterns that it can bring to your attention so that you can at least decide like, do I really want to do this? Right. Yeah. And there's the GitHub for good practice. So yeah, I don't uh, I don't know the story behind yeah. that. I, I did see it come off uh, recently. I mean I follow um that now it's the Mastodon account about you know cran updates. <laughs> right because i'm so worried i'm so worried about seeing one of my packages <laughs> like, that's why i read it every morning <laughs> but so then when there's another package name that i recognize it like makes a small indentation in my brain um oh yeah this came off for okay this so very slowly the last week thing. it got a new maintainer it looks like so uh, so they'll probably that's, that's coming a, back soon Yep. That's a nothing burger, so I presumably it will be back soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so kind of continuing this chain, uh, Gabby Palomo asked um, what some of your most used packages are on a daily basis, if we if there's anything that we haven't already covered. Um, and if not, it, you know, if we've covered no, everything. No, because it's just, it's just <laughs> like maintaining the packages that maintain packages or using them to maintain other packages. Right. It's just all super circular. So. Are you working with Quarto vignettes yet? No, but I, I, you know, realize that that is, has <laughs> now, it's been kind of on the radar for a little while, but it's quite recent that Quarto was installed on like the crayons machines. Right. But it's there now. Yeah. So that obviously opens the <laughs> gates to um, leveling up, use this so that it, to the extent that it helps you place vignette infrastructure. It's right. like clearly, I mean, I certainly, um, you know, to the extent that I write this sort of stuff, I am trying to use Quarto more and more because I like simplicity and I like having one way of doing things. <laughs> so if I'm like mostly trying to learn how to do things the Quarto way, then I like to gradually switch everything that can be to doing it that way, just again, to simplify my life. <laughs> right. So I assume that there's like a lot of other package developers are that way as well. So if they're using QMD a lot in other contexts, they'd rather write their vignettes in QMD and their readme.qmd and like that all of that has now, but it's just kind of recent right. that the ecosystem has evolved to the point where that's it's time. So yeah, that we will definitely do the things that make QMD a first class citizen. <laughs> in our packages because it's like possible now like that's right. clearly on the horizon so that'll yeah. make sense i saw is it coming or is it there already that package down um can i think deal it's with gained them? i think so or like this is all it, it's just it's all happening right now right. but <laughs> yes well in the in particular there's something that makes it possible for like for that to be your vignette engine i mean like the, there's right. like a notion of the qmd vignette whatever that means um but that's yes. that's all that's pretty new that's like <laughs> hot from the oven i think um so use this hasn't quite caught up yet because all of those things had to be in place right first that totally makes sense Just trying to see the blame of where build articles uh got qmd processing um i bet it's recent it's fairly recent because it also uh, feels like hadley is working on package down like right now aha uh -huh. yeah so two months ago uh okay, at least that's, in the news so, yeah all right um so gabby also asked um if there are any uh this actually this came up early on when we were reading the book are there any packages you would recommend looking at like on GitHub that are uh, like simple enough to kind of follow along, but are real packages and that you could use to kind of use as a guide 
because you know it doesn't take long going through dplyr to where the code gets confusing to follow that is the absolute worst actually yeah. that is like the anti-example <laughs> yeah <laughs> And so, yes, because, exactly. So we'll read read the opposite. I have tried to read DeepWire <laughs> at some point. And it's just like, as soon as you feel like I'm about to get to the good stuff, you just you get it's dropped into C++. Yeah, no, yeah. no, you just oh, get dropped off yeah, in the right. C++ train station. And you're like, this is not what I, I was can't follow for. anything. Right. Um, but last time I checked, um, last time I thought about this, um, TidyR, I think like it used to have no compiled code. I don't really? know. Is that still true? Let's check. Um, <laughs> but that made it, ah, it's got a source directory now, oh. I guess, it, <laughs> but there's not a ton. Right. Cause, cause the C++ code in tidy R was last touched three years ago. Okay. okay. So um, I think of, of the tidyverse packages, um, it has like the least astronauty stuff that when you're reading it, you're like, this is not relevant to my package. So I think it's one of the more approachable ones uh, for cats. Again, like I only kind of know a certain universe of packages, but like for cats is also, I think a relatively approachable one where you'd get in there and see patterns that make sense. And you're not immediately doing something really kind of exotic. Um, right makes sense yeah all right and um, yes dplyr is like the worst <laughs> do not <laughs> as are like radar and vroom in my opinion also absolutely well, vroom, yeah it's just that, like that's kind everything of the whole point of all the real stuff <laughs> is going on in places you don't want to go so <laughs> fair enough um so i had a question of uh what are you working on like right now? Is there anything that you can talk about that, you know, There's what were you working on today? Talk about. Oh. I'm, I've, I'm working <laughs> on things that are not public yet, yeah. um, but will be more public in a month or so, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say and August before, or so. <laughs> before August. Um, but I am about to do uh, a use this release. Yep. And um encourage releases and several other package development related packages. Um, but yeah, I've been sort of helping out on things that are not my normal wheelhouse, which is also like adds to me feeling like a little bit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our package wise. Um, but yeah, stuff I'm excited about, but yeah, just pitching in on other types of things. Um, still very related to R and R package development, um, but yeah, the, I think the most relevant thing I'm doing right now is I am gradually switching into back into package development gear to get some things released. And the the main one on my docket is uh, use this, yeah. And then I'm helping out to straighten out a few things about looking at R and these days for the first time, kind of in a in a while making. <laughs> um, especially when you sort of fire up in an RM project, but like all is not well, you know, <laughs> like you haven't right. been there in a while or it's somebody else's RM project. And yeah, that, that like startup, the cold start experience, but that's <laughs> like a small thing, but like it's me sort of thinking about packages and package development and, and I'm not an RM expert by any means. So it's definitely one of those things where I feel like I'm relearning what little I already knew. Fair enough. Yeah, that's how I often feel. Um, you know, if I'm doing normal data science -y work instead of package dev, it feels very, very, like it's a different yes. world. <laughs> yeah, so. there's a lot of like, oh, this, and yeah, just a weird mindset change. Um, as you're getting back into the package development side of things, is there anything that you've learned um, recently where i guess recently can be since the book um or changed your mind about related to package package development hmm. <laughs> i'm gonna look over like titles of chapters <laughs> but i i do not think so 
Yeah, I really haven't had any sort of change of heart or. No. Okay. All right. No. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Excellent. I um, think it's still recent enough that it holds up, in my opinion. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and the last of our, our questions before I go and sift through the chat to see what we have over here, but from our pre uh, generate questions. Um, Trevin asked if you have any book recommendations uh, for our de development, software dev, or really anything else. Um, what should we read next? Well, I haven't read a ton of programming books lately, but I did read uh, Felina Hermann's The Programmer's Brain yep. and yes. did really enjoy it. Half Half the time I was like nodding feeling like vindicated and like see see and then half the time <laughs> it was like kind of new stuff but like both of those feel good right to be like I knew this was a thing and it's just so gratifying <laughs> to see it have a name or to be quantified or you know that someone's written a paper about it um yes so that's the one that like leaps leaps to my mind um but you all do you already have like book clubs that read that we don't because manning doesn't have their books available free online and we only uh, do free online books so that right. anyone anywhere can participate um mm -hmm. unfortunately because i i like that book quite a lot as well <laughs> yeah we read it um we're, we're i guess we're kind of on hiatus right now but we kind of have like an engineering book club within mm -hmm. posit and that was one that we actually read cover to cover um, yeah. in the past, certainly in the past two years. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so um, Jared asked if you have any words of wisdom to share into your insider experiences with developing our packages um, now, do you have any now that have been as impactful to others as your celebrity status tidyverse project oriented workflow talk in 2017, aka the computer fire talk? Um, so do you have any? I don't know. What's what's your update? What's your biggest your, your thing for people to look at? Um, if they only know you from setting computers on fire <laughs> and our programming or our packages, rather. Um. <laughs> I mean, actually, I feel like my biggest lesson from that whole thing <laughs> has been that often the stuff you do or write about sort of bring organize and bring clarity to that has the most impact on people is not some incredibly complicated, <laughs> tons of coding, um, sort of technical Eiffel Tower that you build. It can be kind of capturing like a really basic problem, describing it well and describing a solution and why it's a solution. And, you know, lots of people, I would say like 85% of the people who like read that stuff or whatever, feel the way I just said actually about Felina's book, which are like, <laughs> yes, I was having this problem, but I didn't know how to describe it. And then I certainly hadn't figured out how to solve it, but like, this feels so great to know that other people have this problem and that there is a solution. And then 15% of the people just get really pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so learning that that is a very typical ratio and there's really nothing you can do about that. Um, and then just being excited that those 85% were excited with you for having, like having a crisp statement of a problem is really, really huge and then is is like instrumental in having a crisp solution to the problem <laughs> but so i think the the lesson there is that you don't necessarily have to contribute something that's like the most technical thing in the world that often it's just like problem selection is huge like something i feel that has had a lot of impact that i'm proud of is like the reprex package and just kind of the discipline of writing reprexes which again you know, this is a, it's a convenience wrapper around knitter, but <laughs> but it's one that was worth making. Right. Um, and so that's 
I think a good takeaway is that often you can have a big impact um, by stepping back just a little and not necessarily sort of beavering away at the most difficult technical problem before you, um, but like actually really noticing what you bang your own shins on and what you <laughs> see people around you banging their shins on. I mean, like, well, why hasn't someone fixed that? Even if it doesn't seem very sexy. Um, that has really paid off for me, I think. Like that, <laughs> the like, you. who cares if it's sexy? If enough people are tripping over it, it's worth thinking about. <laughs> so, you, so you you queued up the next question. So oh, is okay. there anything that you wish would be implemented into the R package workflow um, that isn't there right now that you wish like something that annoys you or you know something that you wish there was a tool for? Maybe if you knew of such things, you would have you would just make an issue and use this. But uh... yeah, not, no, there's nothing that's like bugging me right now. Um, the only thing that like like in the past 24 hours, the only thing that's bugged me is that I've learned like, you know, to even tinker with RM, there's just nothing worse than working on one of the packages that manages packages, <laughs> right? Which yeah. is a little bit like working on use this in DevTools, but RM, it's just the worst because if you want to try something in RM, you then have to like create a project and, it, and start right. using R and using your locally installed version so that you can experience your locally installed. Yeah, so, but that's yeah. just, there's certain packages that are just hard to work on because of where they, what they're trying sure. to do. But so there's nothing in, and that's, you know, that's just, there's nothing you can do about that. But th there's nothing I'm, it's like top of mind that I feel like is really bugging me. Was, I mean, something that, none of you may have experienced that was really bugging me is that use this as UI had really kind of fallen behind our current standards in terms of how pretty it looked and how clickable it was. And, and so one of the main reasons I want to release use this is that it has been fully, and this was done a couple of months ago. Uh, we've been waiting to see if, if we did anything wrong. Um, is it's been fully updated using like CLIs functions for okay. talking to the user. So, so, you know, it looks better and things that can be clickable. Like when I say, now you should run DevTools document, you can click on it and it'll run DevTools document right. or like you might want to do PR push now and then you can like click on PR push. And anytime it's talking about a file, in the package that just got created or modified, like now you can click on that and it will open in the editor. Um, so like that was something like use this had started to get kind of behind other packages <laughs> and its user interface. And so that's dealt with now. So that'll be one of the very gratifying things um, to put out there when I release Excellent. it. Excellent. Um, all right. Uh, and then Rebecca Butler has three. I know at least one really good question. I haven't read the other two yet. Uh, <laughs> so um, you had your um, code smells and feels talk. And she asked, are there any package smells and feels that you ha like have thought about? Or is this a new idea? Um, and if so, how can we learn about them? I guess I haven't. Have I quite thought about it? <laughs> I guess when I... The, the main time I end up like drop making like random random drop in calls on other people's packages is when doing rev dev checks and like something comes up and then you have to figure <laughs> out like is it me or is it you and um so then there are certain things that create a sense of dread when you drop in somewhere and it's usually monster monster functions and oh like we we've got a guess. Nope. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, packages that have quite a lot of functionality, but very few files. So yeah, th th those to me make me feel like, oh, like if I want to understand why 
this thing is not working. I don't have the chance to look at one or two functions in isolation. Like I have to look at the whole damn thing because, <laughs> you know, everything touches everything. Um, right. So, yeah, I think complete, complete lack of modularity is something that you end up regretting. It's kind of hard <laughs> get that right um both the first time or like when you're not very experienced and then even on a topic it, there's a reason that we have like ggpot and ggpot2 and <laughs> um you know google sheets and google sheets 4 although i mean that that came because of the api changing but often it's just hard to get the abstractions right the first time and you have to sort of suffer with the wrong ones for a <laughs> while to form a very detailed notion of like what was wrong. <laughs> but so, yeah, figuring out how to yeah. break things into composable pieces turns out to be like very rewarding. So. Yeah, I read, um, I can't remember the name of the author right now, but uh, Five Lines of Code um, is like the extreme version of that concept, uh, Christian Clausen. Okay. Um, it's all about, you know, breaking things down as small as you can and patterns to use to like yeah. make more modular code and everything. And ever since I read that, I like any of my old code looks so bad. Cause well, or just you know, like, and, and there's a limit to, to it. On but, one yeah. little screen of the IDE. Yeah. If you're scrolling around in your functions, that's <laughs> something to yes. think about. But on the other hand, there are, you know, and you see this much less often, but things that feel over engineered, right. like you can't figure out like where the actual work happens. You know, you're like, <laughs> you go to this and you drop into another function and then there's like this method and you're like, where's the business end of this function? <laughs> but like, that's much less common to see. Right. So, I think that usually happens when somebody comes from a different language and they write yeah. R as if it's Java or something like that. <laughs> Fair enough. The dog um, like bar barely fits under there. I don't know if you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> he squeezes <laughs> really down in. Effortful to get back out. It's very funny. Um, so somewhat related to kind of all of that, um, are there some pitfalls that you see new package writers falling into? Um, and, and she says, selfishly, um, especially among people who have read our packages, second edition, but perhaps not fully internalized at all, are there things that make you go, oh, dear, they tried, but. Um, this has nothing to do with people having read it or not read it. Right. Um, but I think a common sort of first timer mistake is to try to fully flesh out the R code, like, like just go nuts on the R directory and then be like, I'll write the documentation later. I'll write the <laughs> tests later. Um, because, and I think it's easy to do that because writing R code is probably the thing you're most familiar with because that you, you come to that from your data analysis work and your script writing being like fairly comfortable writing R and probably fairly comfortable writing R functions. Um, but it turns out like, making a small change, writing the documentation, writing some examples, writing some tests, adding it to a vignette. And that's like a little unit of work. And then you add the next function. So that feels scarier or because so many of those parts are less familiar and write the documentation, push it to the package down site. Like, but it turns out that um, having the documentation and the tests they're providing you feedback on, oh, maybe this function actually needs a tweak to its design. Right. Um, because now that I try to use it in this vignette, I can see like there's an obvious problem or like now that I write these tests, I can see it's very hard to test or something like that. So it turns out that if you make this incremental process where you're writing the code, testing it, documenting it, those are providing you like little bits of micro feedback that actually cumulatively change the design of the package. And I think you end up with a better package moving through all the steps over and over and over again, then I'm going to try to write, I'm going to try to write all the R code. And then I'm going to write all my tests. 
and then I'm going to write some documentation. Like you just, and you, you would yeah. think it would be the same, but it is not the same. Um, you end up, I think with a better product if you're like walking through the whole cycle constantly. Um, well, and especially if you get pulled away to work on something else in the middle of that giant also, mess. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it feels like you're moving slower, but you're moving, I think, at a good pace <laughs> and you're going to end up with something that's like much cooler and <laughs> it'll be documented and tested. You know, those things actually happen because you're doing them as you go. But I also think it like changes the way you develop the package in a good way. So that's a workflow thing, right? Like that's yeah. not... It's just that it changes enough of how the package gets written that I think it it does in the end work out better. Yeah, that I think that's great advice. Um, and then the last one from this block of questions from uh, Rebecca, how do you approach the design and scope aspect of package development? Do you have any advice for collaboration and scope? How do you articulate scope to potential collaborators? For example, I've responded to a pull request with this doesn't feel like it fits and that felt bad. Um, yeah. I certainly know how that feels because <laughs> um, I feel like use this in particular seems to present me with that dilemma <laughs> quite often because it's so workflow oriented and everyone has a different workflow. And then if they love use this and use it, they want their workflow to be represented there then but sometimes i'm like i don't want to maintain that code mm -hmm. and so i do have to say no but it does feel bad because you feel like you're not only declining the contribution but that you're saying you're declining their work <laughs> <laughs> so like it does just feel bad um but it's worse to take something that you don't think is a good move and right. either have to remove it later or maintain it with unhappy thoughts in your heart or maintain it poorly mm -hmm. or whatever. So I think it is better, but I think there's a lot to like saying that well and being like, you know, I can't take this on. It's I'm sorry, but, and just, we have learned, we do have some sort of standard replies because they're like really based on lived experience um right. that there are certain things people might want to put in a package that we and i'm thinking specifically of dev tools and use this that just not at all how we work and we have sometimes brought stuff like that in but then when it breaks first of all we're, we never notice because we're not exercising right. that code at all and a lot of these packages aren't super well tested because they're so workflowy um so then things can be broken for a really long time and that's a bad look. <laughs> and then when someone brings it to your attention, you're like not in a good position to fix it. So then it sort of stays broken. I don't know. It feels like having broken windows and graffiti or something. <laughs> so it is better to not let code that you think might become like that in, but it is hard. Yeah. So I think, yeah, finding like the, <laughs> really honest but really empathetic way of saying like i'm just, i'm sorry but like i just can't take this on because you you really do then own it you right. know if it's not if not the direction you wanted to go you just have to say that i think <laughs> even though it feels bad <laughs> do you have a follow-up Okay. Yeah, sorry, I was looking for the hand raise um <clears throat> sorry to jump in thank you for that response can you also speak to the getting a sense of your own sense of scope for it and how you articulate that to yourself and then to other people? So I haven't had many packages. I've had some where like that was my decision. If you look at like stuff I maintain in many, many cases, um, I took over maintenance of something that already existed and was already scoped. Um, so I don't think I have tons of experience with that. I mean, I guess some examples I have 
from like Google Drive and Google Sheets for is like sometimes people want me to do things that I feel like go beyond wrapping the API <laughs> um, in ways that I'm like, I don't want to, if I implement this, like now I'm, I'm in a whole new uncharted, you know, waters. I've sort of taken on scope that I have no intention of, that I didn't really mean to in the first place, but yeah, I don't think I'm a great expert in that. Um, I mean, one thing I have started doing in certain packages to try to articulate things along these lines and then also like internal principles is writing like a, a maintenance document or a design document or um, vignettes just for myself. I do that sometimes. So um, for example, I think like in Google Sheets 4, if you go to the package down site articles, more articles, there's four articles in the developer section that I wrote just basically for myself. Um, and so sometimes I have like messy notes lying around my computer with this sort of stuff, but I started to just make them into actual <clears throat> vignettes. Um, to make myself write them up better. Yeah, like function and class names, like that was a whole thing. Like, how am I gonna name things? Um, but so I think writing some decent internal docs sometimes really clarify, helps you clarify what's in, what's out. How When I face decisions of this nature, how am I gonna decide? Um, and then I have found it just super useful to like write that stuff down stick it in the package you know, just make it an article so that it doesn't ship with the package and you're probably the only person who's going to read or write the thing that's fine but then sometimes it does come up um if someone wants to contribute and then you can actually point them to this document where you're like okay here's how we name things around here or like here's why we don't do that um because you know I tried it and it didn't work and like I can't remember all the details but I recorded my pain here um so yeah, these kind of developer facing docs sometimes can be really useful. And then use this has something similar. Um, if I'm looking at this stuff while talking to you, yeah. not in uh, the website, but. Um, yeah, the principles.md, I linked that yes. one in the chat, yep. Yeah, that came from <laughs> like when I have the package fully uploaded in my head and I do certain things, I I d discerned that there were certain principles um, operating. And then I would go away for like eight months and forget them <laughs> and come back. And I was tired of like re-deriving what these things were. So I started to write them down. Um, and then this, again, this package tends to, for some reason, attract a lot of pull requests. So then it's also nice to have something to link to when you're like, here's yeah. how I want this done. Here's why. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to say on the uh, developer facing articles, we have done book clubs for packages where we read the package down site. So there might be other people who see those other than you. <laughs> well, and, you know, the reason they're there is that it's perfectly fine. For, just you don't yeah. expect many people to have that level of exhaustiveness. Um, yes, but they can be useful. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and this is probably going to be our last question. Uh, again, from Jared, he asks, uh, have you dabbled with generative AI tools in our package dev to help improve your workflow? And if so, what has your experience been? So I haven't <laughs> used them for our package development. But as I said, you know, I'm pitching in on some things that are like different for me. Um, so I've had to work in like uncomfortable places and and Copilot is huge for writing in like a language you're not familiar with, but like you kind of know what you need to do and like you have some taste and some thoughts about it, but you know, you can't just like generate correct syntax <laughs> from your fingertips very easily. So 
I think, you know, I, I do see all the stuff people put about not trusting LLMs or whatever, <laughs> but I will, I mean, Copilot is a huge helper if you know how to use it well, like, and it definitely gives me nonsense sometimes. Let me be super clear <laughs> about that. Um, it's by no means perfect, but like when you think about how good it is already or like how much improvement you're seeing already. Um, so I do think it's game changing. Um, and so I haven't used it much for R, um, but I know, for example, that that Hadley has done whatever you need to do in our studio to make um, Copilot available. And like, I don't think you can chat with it. Maybe you can, I can't remember. But he thinks it's particularly useful, um, like for generating boilerplate code, right? When it's like kind of clear where you're going and like, yes, you would be able to write it, but like, how would you write it? You would copy and paste anyway, right? So it's not like, like, so like let the robots do the stuff robots <laughs> are really good at, right? Um, so no, I don't think it replaces software engineers or develop, you know, design or, but there is a lot of drudgery that we do. And so like, why not let Copilot help with that? And then sometimes it has interesting ideas. And then especially <laughs> when you're working in a language that you're not like an expert and it can be great for just like getting past writer's block. I so think my it, favorite thing. There's lots of caveats and imperfections, yes. but I think it's, I would totally use it in whatever language I'm working at. <laughs> I think my favorite thing with Copilot in uh, in our studio is when I'm doing Tidy Tuesday data sets and I make the line of the table of this week's data set and it suggests next week's. And it's always like, that doesn't actually exist, but that's a neat idea. Yeah. Let me see if I can yeah. find an actual version of <laughs> well, that. It suggests <laughs> functions that absolutely don't exist. You're like, that's yep. the what? That's the function I'm trying to write. You know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, it does crazy stuff like that yep. for sure. Um, but like, it's I still think very very interesting, and certainly I've experienced what I feel like are productivity boosts and confidence boosts from having <laughs> someone to ask all my stupid questions to in the privacy of my own home. Um, yeah, it's a, a rubber yeah, duck that, that, that may that or may not back. be right. <laughs> may or may not be right, but are worth evaluating, right? It gives me something to think about. And and often they are right. So all right. Well, with that, uh again, thank you so much for being here. Um wait, I have to read the stuff about the puppy. Oh yes. She, she's gone now, but um that was Freya. She is one and a half. And she has a big brother who's a red Merle running around somewhere. <laughs> yes, she was very cute. Uh, and going under the couch reminded me of my lab up until way after he should have been going under things when he would try yeah. to go under things like that. So yeah, thank you very much. She gets stuck on that other couch and we have to lift <laughs> oh. it up to let her back out again. <laughs> no. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, we look forward to seeing uh, everything that's happening uh, in a couple of months from now and seeing what's up, what, what maybe you can't talk about. Uh, and uh, just, yeah, as always, thank you for coming. It was very, very um, educational. <laughs> so okay. thank you. That was fun. Thank you. Thanks for reading <laughs> the book. <laughs> and for sure. Bye. All right. Bye bye.